Hello folks and welcome back to my channel. We are talking a little bit more about body jewelry and today I would specifically like to talk about surgical steel. Now, if you have piercings or are thinking about getting a piercings, this is a term that you've probably seen all over when talking about body jewelry. Oh, this is made of surgical steel. Oh, I'm wearing surgical steel. And when most folks hear this, the image that that paints in their mind is steel that you would use for surgery, right? Because if you're gonna call it surgical steel, that's what it would probably be used for. And that makes me think, okay, this is good. Like if they use it for surgeries, it's definitely good. It's definitely safe. It's definitely safe for me to wear. And therein lies why I wanted to make this video because surgical steel is actually just a very clever marketing term that companies have been using to take advantage of people for decades now uh, and convince them that a largely unsafe material is totally safe and totally fine and you should buy it. So let's take a closer look at why. So when we talk about steel, when we're talking about body jewelry, it's not just like 100% steel. Steel is made up of an alloy of different metals, a recipe, if you will, with a certain amount of vandium, a certain amount of nickel, a certain amount of steel, and all of these things get mixed together in a particular order and a particular way to create the steel that we're working with. And different steel has different purposes. Some of it is designed to be used in cars. Some of it is designed to be used in electronics. Others are designed to be used for buildings. Some might be used for forks and knives. And yes, some are used to create operating tables and scalpels and hemostats. And some steel even ends up implanted into the human body in the form of bone screws and hip replacements and things of that sort. But each one of these, but each of these steels follows a different recipe to allow it to be the strongest and safest material for what we're using it for. For example, the steel that they use to make my forks and knives is probably not the steel that you want to use to support an entire bridge. We want to make sure that we're using the right recipe for the right job. Now you might hear that and go, okay, well then surgical steel must be a particular recipe of steel that's designed for surgery and that's safe for your body. And that's where you would be wrong. See, surgical steel is just a catchy marketing term. There's no specific requirements for what has to go into surgical steel. It's kind of like when folks say that you're buying jumbo shrimp. Jumbo shrimp are not like this magical species of shrimp that are just much bigger. They're just really fat shrimp, but they label it as jumbo shrimp and then they can charge you a higher price for those. And a lot of folks think that they're getting a completely different and unique product when it's really very much the same as everything else, just a slightly different size. Well, with surgical steel, because there's no set outline recipe for how we wanna make this steel, people put this label on all sorts of different alloys and mixtures of steel, some of which might be safe to go in your body, but a lot of which are absolutely not safe at all. And you don't even have to take my word for it. Direct from the page about surgical steel on Wikipedia, there is no formal definition on what constitutes a surgical stainless steel. So product manufacturers and distributors often apply the term to refer to any grade of corrosion resistant steel. This just means that manufacturers all over the world are slapping the label surgical steel on lots of different things so that it makes it sound cleaner and safer and better and stronger and makes you as a consumer want to spend your money on it. And this should come as no surprise. We see companies do this stuff all of the time. They use marketing terms and they use what's popular and catchy and packaging and clever images in order to get you to buy their product. That's their whole goal is to get you to spend money with them. So of course, it's not surprising at all to hear that a lot of jewelry companies and manufacturers are gonna use sketchy terminology to convince you that their stuff is safe and worth buying. But there's actually a lot that goes into how we designate materials and their specific uses. There's an organization known as the ASTM or the American Society for Testing and Materials who handles a lot of this. They test all sorts of different materials, look at the chemical makeups, the manufacturing and production of these materials and set forth minimum standards by which people need to produce these materials in order for them to be used for specific purposes. So for example, if you wanna use a type of steel for building a house, you have to meet very rigid specifications for a type of steel that is gonna be safe to build a house out of, strong enough to support a house, withstand weather and natural events and occurrences. It's got to be safe for the people living in this house. 
Likewise, the ASTM sets forth standards for a lot of medical implants and medical devices. They look at things like biocompatibility or how well these different materials are compatible with our bodies and our biology. And they say, okay, in order for this to be biocompatible, it must follow this exact specific recipe. It must be made this way. It must not have these other metals or materials in it. Otherwise, when we try and put it in people's bodies, it's going to cause an issue. It's gonna cause an adverse reaction. It's going to hurt people. And these specifications are very, very, very specific thanks to decades of very intense research, experimentation, and documentation on behalf of scientists, surgeons, biologists, and doctors all over the world who have combined this education and information together to figure out these minimum standards in order to keep people safe. The body piercing industry borrows from these standards for the requirements we have for our jewelry. So we expect our jewelry to meet ASTM standards for implantation in the human body. Because when we're doing a body piercing, we are creating a wound, we are creating a wound and we are putting a piece of jewelry in it. And in order for that wound to heal properly, it's very, very important that that jewelry is biocompatible and it's not going to cause issues with how this wound heals. When we talk about metals for use in implantation in the body, there are two things that are very, very important, micro cleanliness and nickel content. Now nickel is a very common known sensitizer. A lot of people are reactive to nickel. I personally am so reactive to nickel that on a lot of jeans that I own, I have to sew a little patch over the button on the inside because otherwise it'll literally break me out on my stomach because of the nickel in that button. And nickel sensitivities are just that, they're sensitivities. So they often can become worse through exposure. So the more nickel you're wearing, the more nickel you're coming in contact with, the more sensitive to it you can be. In fact, over in Europe, they have something called the ECC Nickel Directive, which limits the amount of nickel that can be in products, specifically products sold to children, to try and minimize nickel sensitivities and reactions. Now, all steel contains nickel, but when we talk about steel that we're planning to use for implantation in the body, the exact nickel content becomes very, very important. And this is in part because of people's reactivity to nickel, but also when we talk about ASTM F138, which is the ASTM designation for implant grade steel, which is to say steel that is designed to be implanted in your body, there is a set level of nickel content that is permissible in ASTM F138 steel. And it's actually a little higher than the nickel content that is in your classic stainless steel uh, or surgical steel 316L. This is because nickel can become magnetic through the process of cold working the metal. And cold working is often used as part of the process of producing implant grade steel. If there is too little nickel when the metal is cold worked, it becomes magnetic. This affects the ability for these pieces to be run through an MRI, used in difficult, different medical procedures, uh, and can be very unsafe in our body. But we also don't wanna have too high of a nickel content that is going to cause people to have an adverse reaction. So the amount of nickel that is allowed in implant grade steel is very, very strictly regulated. And again, implant grade steel, especially that meets ASTM specifications, is safe for implantation in the body, is a great material. I'm wearing some of it in my ear right now. But surgical steel, as we just discussed, doesn't have any of these rigorous standards to follow. There's not one ASTM setup for surgical steel that's out there. There's instead dozens of different requirements for steel with different purposes, and a lot of companies just use the term surgical steel to refer to this wide breadth of steel that you can use for all sorts of different things. Now, the other thing that I mentioned is micro cleanliness. So in this context, we're talking about the amount of inclusions or particles or trace pieces of other metals that can be allowed into the final product of steel, depending on what they're using it for. So if we're using steel to like make some forks and knives to eat with a dinner, there can be some inclusions and impurities in that metal, and it's not really gonna cause any major issues. But if we're talking about steel that we want to literally implant into our body or put into a healing wound, the presence of those inclusions can cause serious health concerns. So ASTM F138 steel has very specific limitations as far as micro cleanliness goes and the amount of inclusions and types of inclusions that are permitted in steel to meet these specifications. 
And even if standard versions of steel meet the inclusion limitations to be considered implant grade, if they don't meet the exact chemistry of implant grade materials, then they do not qualify as something that is implant grade and safe to be in the body. And even among types of steel that frequently get used in implantation, there is a lot of discussion within the medical community about where that line for safety is and what is safe to use for implantation. In general, a lot of folks will work with 316L or 316LVM. Generally, folks prefer 316LVM, that VM afterwards standing for vacuum melting, which is an extra process that the metal goes through to remove some of those impurities and also to make the metal safer for implantation. But again, even 316LVM can have impurities or can have chemistry that does not meet the rigorous standards for implantation in the body. And it's worth noting that while ASTM F138 and 139 are frequently used in medical implants, body piercing and body modification, an immune system reaction to nickel is still possible with any level of steel, which is why you'll see a lot of implants these days and a lot of body jewelry these days be made of implant grade titanium, which is nickel free. Now, like I mentioned, I have a very severe nickel sensitivity, but I am still able to wear implant grade steel in my ears just fine. That is not the case for everyone, so that is something to be mindful of. Steel made to implant grade specifications is far less likely to cause a nickel reaction and a nickel response in someone than other random mixtures and alloys of steel that are out there. And why it's so important to understand these things and understand how strict the manufacturing process for implant grade materials is, is because nothing like that exists for just surgical steel. Again, there's no ASTM surgical steel. <laughs> it's just a marketing term. People can say surgical steel and maybe meaning to imply implant grade steel, but they also might just mean the steel that surgical tools are made of, or the operating table is made out of, or the autoclave they use to sterilize things is made out of. And while that steel may be totally safe to make an autoclave out of or make an operating table out of, that doesn't mean that it's safe to literally go inside of your body. But because of clever marketing and the way we interpret these terms, we as consumers hear surgical steel and assume that that means that it's going to be safe to end up in our bodies. And that is just unfortunately not the case. So I wanted to make this video to talk about some of the differences between surgical steel and implant grade and just how much goes into the creation of implant grade materials to hopefully educate you a little bit so that way you do not get taken advantage of by seeing surgical steel on a jewelry listing and thinking, oh, oh my gosh, this is gonna be totally safe for me to wear. I'm gonna get it. If you want jewelry that is going to be safe, it is very important that you look for implant grade steel. And don't just take my word for it or the manufacturer's word for it. If a company actually produces quality safe implant grade steel, they should have something like this, a mill certificate available for this metal. This is a certificate that states exactly what the components of the metal are and how it was worked in order to show that it meets specifications for implantation in the human body. Uh, it's basically the recipe that they followed to make the steel. And they're saying, hey, we followed the exact recipe for implant grade. This is the proof that this is what we did. And it's very important to have these mill certifications because again, a lot of companies will lie and mislead you about the quality of their pieces. If you'd like to learn more about this, you can actually access ASTM designations and a lot of the research that went into setting them for free online through their website uh, and through online PDFs of different ASTM requirements for different materials. So I strongly encourage you to check that out. The Body Jewelry Verification Program through the Association of Professional Piercers also has a lot of incredible information online about understanding different materials that you wear in your body, and so does the Association of Professional Piercers website. And if you'd like to read a little bit more about the differences between surgical steel and implant grade, I do also have some articles on my blog post that cover this topic. I hope this helps you feel much more educated and much more informed about what you're putting in your body. Uh, and I'm a little bit of a materials nerd. So if y'all want to see me geek out on some more videos about different materials we use in body piercing and what makes them safe versus unsafe, let me know in the comments down below. Or if you think this is boring and you want me to stick to my normal piercing content, let me know that too. All right, folks, thanks so much for sitting down and chatting and I can't wait to hang out with y'all again soon. Bye.